And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who loves the Rifleman. Hi, folks, and welcome back to the Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, do I have something to tell. I'll tell you about the Rifleman later. But I'm so happy now because it's, well, first of all, it's great to be back on Milleronia. I love it here, and of course, the Colonel does too. And he flies on his jet now, which he deserves. And well, everything is just its just terrific here. The weather is beautiful every day. And I know that's because I control the weather. I know. But it doesn't mean I still don't deserve credit for controlling it so well. That's my, that's my feeling. And, uh, I, uh, yeah, I make it, I make it gorgeous every day. Boy, I love Milleronia. And, uh, here we are now at, uh, well, Stately Miller Manor 2, because obviously the uh, main house on the mainland is Stately Miller Manor. But, uh, oh, it's so good to be back. And there's so many good holidays coming up. True, most of them based around me. But again, it's my island, and I put the name on the island, and I control the weather. Why, why the heck not? That's my feeling. Uh, oh, and it, of course, it makes me so happy. As always, the music has the same effect on the colonel. That's, of course, the Nigel Havers Orchestra and the Alice Klieg Dancers, featuring boy tenor Sven Gulli asking the musical question, I have a store? First of all, yes, you do. And it's a terrific store. And by the way, I relate to that. I relate to you wondering about that because... Well, we have the Larry Miller store when you go to, well, when you go to our website and you can go on that. And that's, I've always felt that way too. So there's a store. We have a store. But why the heck not Sven Gulli? And I have something more to say about him. High praise for Sven Gulli coming up. And by Amazon. That's right. Amazon's still one of the greatest companies in the world. And not just because they send us money for everything you order. Okay, it is that. But you know what? Go to Amazon. They get everything. You can get whatever you can imagine, whatever you want in the world on Amazon, except, of course, an actual Amazon. You can't get those. And if you do, remember, contact us before anyone else. Don't call the papers. Don't call your folks. Don't call a best friend from school. Do nothing like that. Call us first. If the doorbell rings and it's a gorgeous, muscular Amazon, call me and Colonel Jeff. And we'll, well, we'll take care of it. We'll make sure you're okay. And uh, first, of course, well, we'll make sure she's okay. So Amazon is a great place. And they do. You know what? Whatever you order, they send us a percentage of that and that makes us very happy. And why wouldn't it? So go to Amazon. You can get there a hundred different ways. But our favorite way is let us take you. Go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Oh, brother, that string went out again. <laughs> wow, that's... Uh... <laughs> Well, I'll look into that, by the way. And, you know, we're pretty strict here on Milleronia. I hope you know that, because for a bad guitar string like that, that could get you, well, tossed in a volcano. We have three volcanoes. Volcano number one, volcano number two, and see if you can guess. That's right, volcano number three. And, uh, well, there's, there's no petitions to make up after. If you're sentenced to one of those, up you go. And, uh... That's right, up you go. Ollie Dungmeister Jr., who runs the volcanoes now, and uh, his dad did before him, and his father's father before him, and uh, before there even was a Milleronia. They ran the volcanoes, and they deserve it. So remember, once you see Ollie, 
Good luck now, Potato Head. So go to our website, and we have a banner that says Amazon. And click our banner that says Amazon, and then forget about the whole thing. We'll get you to there. You know, you, you once you click our banner, go take a nap in your lazy boy chair. Just you know, put a magazine over your face and catch a few Zs. And you don't even have to do anything elaborate. You don't have to turn on the TV. Uh, you don't have to make yourself a nice sandwich and a giant cold beer. Although that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And uh, But you don't have to. Take a nap and we'll get you to Amazon. And you can order anything in the world you want. And you may be able to buy more than you think you can now because, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to win Larry Miller's money. (laughs) I love that theme. I don't know what it is and, and who cares? It's just, it made me laugh every time I heard it. Colonel Jeff found that. It's one of the things he finds, and he knows it's funny, even though he doesn't know how either. It's like the theme to our show. It's a great theme. It's wonderful. Well, Colonel Jeff found that, and I'm glad he did. But uh, so you know what? Yes, it's time to win Larry Miller's money. (laughs) By the way, as you can guess, that band isn't kidding around either. You don't want to go up, but they have those giant thick guitars there. You don't want to catch that in the head. Anyway, (laughs) this is a contest for the change that was in the console of my car. Now, I've mentioned this. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, that I got a new car, and there was I kept change in the console of the old one because I figured that, well, I'll use it to, uh, to buy things like tools at bridges even though there are no bridges and no tolls. But never mind that now. And I thought I could get things with that money. So, But since I never did, it just grew over three years to, well, it didn't look like that much. And I mean, it didn't bother me. And it was just in the console. The console being about, by the way, five inches uh, wide and about, oh, two or three inches uh, long and or reverse those words, but it's two inches by five inches, really, and about two inches deep. It didn't look like that much, but I stood as part of cleaning things out of the the car, and I'm kind of neat. There wasn't a lot to clean. There was I I took that and I put it in a shopping bag, a Brown Ralph's shopping bag, and then to take you know we'll take a look so we could take a photo of it. I uh, dumped it out on the desk here in our studio. And uh, actually, it was back on the mainland, so it was at Stately Miller Manor. And you, uh, the point is, I since then, a couple of days ago, I put it in, well, those money coin wrappers that we all know. So it's quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And you can see the photograph. And if you guess it, well, that's the contest. Guess how much money there is in that pile and tell us enter you know just uh, all you have to do is go on our website on facebook at facebook.com slash larry miller show and also it'll be on twitter at larry miller show but you know the best way uh colonel jeff thinks and he knows best on these things because i didn't even understand what i just read and uh the best way may be Please email it to us at Larry Miller Show at gmail.com. Boy, I sound like someone at Checkpoint Charlie trying desperately to say things correctly. And so do that. Let us know. Take a guess. And guesses will be accepted, by the way, until May 10th at midnight, MST. That's Milleronia Standard Time. And, uh, well, but I'm just teasing uh, about that. We don't have a standard time. We accept all times. And any time, night of the day, you send it in and email it to us at, uh, as I said, Larry Miller Show at gmail.com. And in the event of a tie, I will draw one name at random out of a cocktail shaker. And I'm not kidding with that. That's true. 
And in fact, that was Colonel Jeff's idea. You know, he said, let's use a cocktail shaker. And he said, do you have one of those? And I gave one of those looks of, it's like going to Rome and saying, any restaurant in Rome and saying, do you have spaghetti? Uh, so, yes, we knew we have a cocktail shaper. In fact, several. And I will draw one name at random out of a cocktail shaker. And this is open to U.S. residents only. There's a reason for that, uh, because uh, I've never said something like that. But we know we have a listener in Morocco, and if he won, we can't afford to spend far more to get it to him than is actually there. So those of you, if you guess it or if you get close to it, you win it, and we're going to send you the actual change that I have put in those, that's the name on the box here, Easy Wrap Coin Wrappers. Well, and then it says the same thing in a foreign language, but... Uh, 216 sturdy preformed wrappers. And uh, you can make your own pun joke out of that. I'm, I wouldn't touch it. But do that, folks. You have till May 10th at midnight. And uh, take a look. Go to where I just told you and take a look at that pile and send us a guess. And who knows? Maybe you'll be calling all sorts of services on the Internet and ordering things with what you win. And obviously, I'm not going to tell you what I what's there, uh, because that would be that would be even dumber than we get here. Okay, in fact, far dumber. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. Oh boy! Well, this is and by this is one of the favorite things I do. I love this show and I love doing it. I love my show and the show we make here. Uh, but this is a good one. The Colonel and I both enjoyed this. In uh, in the Wild West, a fella walks into a saloon, and uh, he's a stranger in town, and he's, well, he's got two guns on, and he's got the boots and the spurs, and he's all, he's all done up. And this is the kind of town that they tease people. They, they, it's just grown up that way that they, uh, they uh, always like to have a little fun with strangers in town. And he uh, gets a beer and he has it there. And he drinks that and he wipes his mouth and he nods goodbye to the bartender there. And he walks back out and his horse is gone. His horse was stolen. All right, it's not there where he just tied it up to the hitching post. And he stands there and he purses his lips and he doesn't like that at all. And he turns around, walks right back into the saloon, and he just says to the bartender and everyone in there, he just says, I don't like that, and I don't take it. I want my horse back. I don't care what you think, and I don't care who thinks that's funny. It's not. Last time somebody stole my horse like that was in Texas, and I did what I had to do, and I don't want to do it again. And I will. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to order another beer. I'm going to turn my back to the door, and I'm going to have that beer, and I'm going to drink that beer, and I'm going to like that beer, and then when I'm finished, I'm going back outside again, and if my horse is not right back where I left it, I'm telling you, I'm going to do what I did in Texas, and I don't want to do what I did in Texas. And people are frozen there, and they, they he turns to the bar, and the bartender Gives him another beer, and he sits there and sips his beer and finishes that beer. And with nothing else said, doesn't wave goodbye to anyone, he turns, walks right out of the bar, and sure enough, there's his horse back where he left it, and it's tied back to the hitching post, and he grunts to himself, all right, all right. and he goes over to his horse and pats him on the head, and uh, just before he swings up into the saddle, the bartender comes out the saloon too and uh, says, uh, Say, partner, what was it you did in Texas? And the guy turns and says, I had to walk home. <laughs> we like that. That's a pretty good joke. Once again, as always, if you like that joke, keep it alive. Tell it to a friend. Tell it to someone in your family. And uh, keeping keeping a good joke alive is... Well, it's just as valuable as keeping art alive or keeping a nice piece of music alive. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The P. 
Poetry Corner. string quartet this is by the great william butler yates and it's called running to paradise as i came over windy gap they threw a half penny into my cap for i am running to paradise and all that i need do is to wish and somebody puts his hand in the dish to throw me a bit of salted fish and there the king is but as the beggar. My brother Mortine is worn out with scalping his big brawling lout, and I am running to paradise. A poor life do what he can, and though he keep a dog and a gun, a serving maid and a serving man, and there the king is but as the beggar. Poor men have grown to be rich men, and rich men grown to be poor again, and I am running to paradise. And many a darling wit's grown dull, that tossed a bare heel when at school, now it has filled an old sock full, and there the king is but as the beggar. The wind is old and still at play, while I must hurry upon my way, for I am running to paradise. Yet never have I lit on a friend to take my fancy like the wind, that nobody can buy or bind, and there the king is but as the beggar. Isn't that nice? Well, you can't beat a great fellow like William Butler Yeats, and uh, the colonel and I, I've mentioned before, we've talked about this before, that there are some names, you just have to be a poet when you get that name. And I think that William Butler Yeats, can you beat that name? That guy can't be a plumber. He needs to be a poet. And he sure is running to paradise. Keep that one in mind. I think you should. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. The Magic Movie Moment. Oh, this is a great segment, and I love this too. And remember, I'm happy being back on Milleronia. You know, uh, this is why I mentioned the wonderful actor Nigel Havers in the beginning, and Alice Krieg, who is in this movie too, and she's terrific. The movie is Chariots of Fire from 1981, directed by Hugh Hudson. And what a cast. Ben Cross, Ian Charlson, Ian Holm, Alice Krieg, Nigel Havers, so many others. And you know what, folks? I just saw it again about a week ago. And it's terrific. It's still terrific. It tells its story so well. Mm. And, uh, and the cast is so great, and it's so well blocked and so well directed, so well edited, and it is about the Olympics in 1924. Well, it's about many things, but it's about these two great runners of uh, roughly college age, and uh, the one. These are all true characters, by the way. They're they're. It's not based on the fact. These are the facts of this story. And uh, Harold Abrahams, a student at Cambridge. And Eric Little, who was a very devout member of the Church of Scotland. And uh, he trains and lives in Scotland, although he was born to a missionary family in China. But it's a terrific story, folks. It's so well done. And you know what? You really, well, for lack of a better phrase, you get into it again. I was so into it and watching these people think and work and live. I really forgot they were actors for a while. I thought, well, look at that. They're meeting with the Prince of Wales now. What's that the Prince of Wales? It's a guy. But I mean, oh, you could say, well, the Prince of Wales is just a guy too. That's true. But boy, they make it look great in the movie. They make it look just the way it should at the Olympics in Paris in 1924. And the magic movie moment for me, there are many in this movie. 
But the magic movie moment for me was when Eric Little from Scotland enters his race after not being able to run on Sunday, and uh, meaning on the Sabbath. He wouldn't do that. And, well, Lord Lindsay, one of the other fellows on the English team, offers to let him run his race because, well, Lindsay had uh, just won a silver medal that day in uh, his event, the High Hurdles. And he comes in to where, well, Eric Little is meeting with the Prince of Wales and a couple of the lords who run the Olympic Committee there. And they're in Paris. And they're in a big, fancy, empty ballroom, intentionally that way. And they're talking about what they might do. But Eric Little is not moving. He's immovable. And he has such a great honesty and honor in the way he presents himself. And they realize this is not, I remember one of the lords was saying, in my day it was country first, then God. And he's great too. They're wonderful actors in this. But, uh, well, the character, Eric Little, gets to run on Thursday in place of Lord Lindsay, who gave it up for him. And he runs, and it's like a 400-meter race. It's a foot race, and he wins. He runs hard, and he, and, he, and he wins. And his family came to Paris to see him. His family came from Scotland. Not the whole family, but his sister Jenny and one of his brothers and a friend of his who manages him. And they're in the stands in Paris at the Olympics, and they're watching him, and he wins. And he runs so hard. And his teammates... All the English team lift him up on their shoulders. They're so happy for him. And we are too. And they pick him up and they walk him over so they, he can wave to all the British civilians, all the British citizens who came to see the Olympics and to see him run. And we see his face as he waves, as he holds his hands together and, you know, as the, as the champion pose and being held up again by on the, on the shoulders of all his teammates. And we see his family sitting there, and them smiling and reacting, and being the people they are, and he sees them too. It's a very touching moment. It's very well done. And with all the drama that is around everything that's occurred, we're really happy for him, as happy as he is. And folks... If there's ever a magic movie moment, that's it. Please see it. If you haven't seen Chariots of Fire, see it. You know what? You won't be sorry. And if you've seen it a bunch of times like me, and it's been a while, see it again. Boy, you won't be sorry with that either. And uh, you'll wave to the crowd the same as Eric Little did. And you know what? It, it it moved me so much, it reminded me of Me TV. And what is that? Well, uh, Colonel Jeff has been telling me for months, in fact, for a couple of years now. I love old westerns. I love old TV shows and old movies also. And, well, you know that. But, I mean, I love these things. And on Saturday, Saturday morning, uh, back on the mainland there, there's, uh, oh, you can see sometimes The Rifleman is on. And I love that. Chuck Connors, oh, Lord, and Paul Fix, who plays Micah, the sheriff, and Johnny Crawford, who plays the rifleman's son, plays Mark. And they're all so good. The stories are very well written. But I I like these things. And Colonel Jeff has been calling me up and telling me, and you know, hey, you know, I'm watching so-and-so. He mentions the show. He's, he says, I, I'm watching this now. Turn it on. Me, TV. You got to have it somewhere on the thing. And you know these all these uh, cable, well, organizations. And I don't know what we have. And I, I know I can look through, well, a hundred stations or so. And I do each time. And I did. And I I would go through it. Because I, you know, not to, Colonel Jeff knows what I like. And I like what he likes. And I'd love to see the show he was watching. And I never did because I never could. And he called me the other night again. Uh, it was a Saturday night, in fact. 
show shows how exciting our lives are, by the way. <laughs> but oh, he said to me, Larry, you know what? Look, look through again. We've got to find it this time. And I went through this and that, and he took me through. And uh, you know, is it this channel? That is it? Is it the, in the hundreds or the three hundreds or the five hundreds or the? And then we went back to just regular channels. You know, regular TV channels. And sure enough, in our area, we found it. We found it, and it was, it was channel 27. And, oh, I turned it on. I said, I can't believe it. There it is, metv.com. But it's on. The show was on. I can't remember the first one even that was on. Folks, they play so many things that are great. And, wow, I found it that such good shows some old, some relatively old or new, or Wagon Train, Maverick, Charlie's Angels, Lost in Space, Perry Mason, The Carol Burnett Show, Columbo, so many others. Plus, in the half-hour world, oh, Hogan's Heroes, Andy Griffith, The Honeymooners, Abbott and Costello, The Rifleman, Have Gun, Will Travel, Leave It to Beaver, Father Knows Best, my three sons, Dick Van Dyke. I mean, and and again, so many others. I, I can't even can't even tell you. Well, like I could, but I mean, you don't want me to just list the schedule there, folks. Find me TV, M E T V, and you know, holy mackerel, shows like yeah. Well, and by the way, huge stars are on these shows more than you'll expect more than i expected i mean on wagon train for instance i've been watching this i've seen a few of them now and uh ward bond who's a great actor and it was in so many oh wonderful movies like uh the quiet man with john wayne and he played ward bond played john l sullivan in uh the movie starring errol flynn where he plays uh, uh gentleman jim corbett who winds up beating, in real life, he wound up beating John L. Sullivan, the heavyweight champion of the world. Ward Bond is great, and Robert Horton's in that too, but folks, on this show, Betty Davis I saw today, and that's another, God bless her, she's such a great star and such a great actress that you looking at this show and thinking, what in the world is on the, how did they get her on this show and she wasn't out of show business she was still a star in movies all over the place and this is roughly 1958 or a little a couple of years earlier but you know what she was terrific i saw another one yesterday with ernest borgnine who is one of the greatest actors you've ever seen yes he played quentin McHale on McHale's navy and so many things and so many movies and what a great actor. And he was with a guy playing his son. And just even in an opening scene, I, I glanced at it and I said, wait a minute, is, 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 wait, you know, that looked like... And it was. It was Leonard Nimoy. It was, well, Mr. Spock. About uh, 10 years before he was Mr. Spock and he was playing one of Esteban's son. They played a Basque family from the Basque country in the Pyrenees, and uh, the sons had come, the three sons had come to America years before, uh, six or seven years before, and now their father, Esteban, Ernest Borgnine, who's, well, just a big, tough, loving man, and he came to look for his sons, and it's a great story and very moving, very sad, hoping that one of the brothers dies and is killed by one of the other brothers, and they're so sad and so afraid. And I kept thinking, and get a load of that. It's Leonard Nimoy, who, by the way, had to cry three times in this story. And I'm just saying that because as an actor, you know, you watch actors and he was really good at it. Borgnine is just, well, wonderful. He's a huge, magnificent presence. And it winds up that winds up at a monastery, which Leonard Nimoy is joining, and as part of his penance. But the, folks, 
these shows are terrific. And there's someone else there who has his own show, Sven Gulli. That's right, who we spoke about before I mentioned, and that he's terrific. He plays well. He shows uh, horror movies, and some are some are older, and it's great. You know, to me, I'm I'm not a big scary movie fan, but these are terrific. You know, when the guy, because the the bad guys, the, the monsters always walk slowly. I like that in the older movies. They come at you with the with the hands held up in the claw shape, and they da 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 da, da and the uh, beautiful young woman's going ah ah. Ah, and then she doesn't. She never runs away soon enough, but that's that's all right. And Sven Gulli is, well, he always says, "Oh, what happened to her?" He comes back and he's and announcing it and narrating it, and he has his own segments there, and uh, he's terrific, and he's all dressed up as well, Sven Gulli, and he looks great. And yes, as he said, my store, I have a store. He has a store there. Do, you know, do this, folks, because you know what? Hollywood saves more than it throws away, and I like that. You know, I I know I've mentioned occasionally things that are, all these things are true. I had an office at Universal for, well, eight years, nine years, and uh, the sorority and uh, fraternity houses from Animal House are still there at Universal, and you think, well, golly, look at that. And they keep them, and they use them. They shoot things there. And uh, they have a whole section for Jaws. And, boy, that's pretty, you know, people, all the uh, folks who are from out of town, a lot of tourists come there, and they get on those cars, and they go around. That's a big That's a big thing, the, the Jaws show there. And, uh, and the Leave it to Beaver house. The whole house, the original house that you know, is on its block that you know you know that block and it's still the exact same the, the when the boys walk up in the beginning of the show when they're coming home from school around that curve well you know what it's still there i've used it i've shot in that house i've shot three shows in that house one of them was a uh, desperate housewives in fact and i thought that was the greatest thing in the world cuz i knew where i was and i thought get a load of this how do you like that this is 60 years later, and I'm shooting in the Leave it to Beaver house, in the Cleaver house. Well, and I got to walk up that path, and I got to walk on that street. I don't mean for fun at lunchtime. I mean as part of what I was shooting. Well, I think that's pretty neat. And uh, I, you know what? I was on the Jaws tour, in fact, because... Uh, two sons of friends of mine. I've talked about my friend Hamilton many times and his wife, Marsha, God bless her, and she's passed on now. But, oh, what a wonderful family she had and has. And her nephews, who were English, came to the United States. And the uh, older one, Russell, joined the Marines. He wanted to. And, of course, the Marines will take, as I hope you know, the Marines will take a, Anyone, you know, well, technically he's English. That doesn't matter to them. Someone who qualifies, and he wanted to be a pilot. And he qualified first as a helicopter pilot. And uh, by the way, these are things that are flown in war. This is not helicopter on the way to the golf course. And boy, Russell, Russell. Oh, boy, and uh, Robert, it's so funny. So they came to my office, which was at Shady Acres on the Universal lot there. And Shady Acres was Tom Shadyak. He was a great writer and director. He'd done so many things like, well, the Ace Ventura movies, so many things. Oh, he directed 10 just huge movies. And he hired me several times, in fact. that uh, Boy, I, I just love the guy. And so I, I uh, had an office in his building there. And here, uh, Russell and Robert came in, and uh, we figured we could go get uh, lunch on the lot there. They have a couple of nice places to eat. And uh, I so I, I packed the three of us in one of the golf carts from Shitty Acres. Everybody has golf carts on the Universal lot. Not everyone, but I mean, they have, 
in a lot of the offices and a lot of the buildings, a lot of the bungalows, well, they have, uh, it comes with a golf cart that Universal gives you. And that's how you zip around the lot. And, oh boy, I love working on that lot. And we went to lunch and then I figured, uh, well, you know what? Let's take, I'll show him a couple of the things at Universal. And I did. I took him onto the Jaws path there that has the big, I use the word ride, but it's a bigger thing than that. They have a show. They have the shark come out of the water and it looks like it's going to attack you. And if you remember, that's a big shark. As they say in the movie, one of the, uh, I think, uh, I think Richard Dreyfus says, that's a 20 footer. And then Robert Shaw just says, 25. And, well, that's a terrific movie anyway. But sure enough, I took them on there and we were on a path on in the golf cart after lunch. Now, I don't know where I'm going. I work on the lot there. I've, you know, shot many things on the lot, but I don't actually know where I'm going to be in, in the Jaws show. And so we're all outdoors there, and it's course, and it's uh, I'm on this one path, and uh, then some of the tiny gates came up to block you. We were on the path. I got us onto the path that's normally part of the show, meaning you don't you stop, you don't keep going, and what happens then? It floods as part of I don't know why. Maybe you've been on the thing. Maybe you know why because they have a narrator. They have a guide on these big, long carts who, that are open-air carts, and uh, all the tourists are in them, you know, maybe 50, 100 people. And he's saying that here we go with the thing, and the th- now the shark will come up in this. But I'm in the cart with Russell and Robert, and uh, <laughs> and the water starts rising above the path. I mean, on the path we're on, it's a little lower than where everything else is, and it's rising as part of whatever the thing is that happens. And I mean rising that it gets to the bottom of your tires and doesn't stop. It keeps going, and you can't go forward or backwards. And by the way, about what's about 20, 30 feet higher on the path, just to, just to, you know, away, oh, about 50 feet away is uh, one of the carts, one of the tourist carts. And the guy said, oh, there's the booth. And he was so nice, the narrator just says, uh, Say, you know, that's Larry Miller then in the cart down there. And everyone waved. He said, wave. And I waved back. And uh, he said some nice things. He's been, been in this, been in that. And he's working on this and that now. And and he says, it's good to see you, Larry. And I said, good to see you. And then he said, uh, he looked at us and said, Are you all right down there? <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, are you in, do you need some help? And I said, but I didn't know anything. I just, no, we're fine. You know, go ahead, do your stuff there with all the folks. Bye, folks. Now, I didn't know anything, and they rolled away, and sure enough, that water is still rising. Now, we weren't scared because, well, for crying out loud, you got two really tough Englishmen, and one, Russell, had just joined the Marines. So he's a United States Marine, and he was uh, he was an officer too. He went in as a lieutenant because he's going to be a pilot. And uh, so we weren't scared. I mean, we figured, well, if worse comes to worse, we'll you know dive into the water or just walk through it hip deep. But we weren't walking. We're just sitting there, and we started giggling. We couldn't stop laughing. And the water went up. And by the way, it got to our feet. And then stopped and, well, went back down again, not fast, you know, just started to go down again, as happens, I guess, on the ride. And uh, we couldn't stop laughing. Then we looked at each other and said, well, I guess there's a lucky break. And sure enough, went down, and now it's below the below the tires, below the path we're on, and there's water dripping all over the place. And I just looked at them said, and shrugged and just turned it on again. You try to, you know, you turn the tiny key and then push a button, and it went on. It came on again. And I said, well, again, well, how do you like that? And then we <laughs> rolled off. I went back to the path that I saw the other, the tourist thing on. And I forget, they ought to know where they're going. And uh, I didn't even get there, but I got us, well, back to the street with the sorority houses. <laughs> and that was fine. 
But you know something? You never know. I love that Hollywood saves those things. And I love that those things, by the way, oh, on the Universal lot, Columbo's cars were always there in the section of the parking lot. It was regular parking lot for employees, but they always had those two. If you remember, he had a Nash convertible. It was about oh, 25 years old or something. And uh, it was a little banged up, but that was the way it was supposed to look. It was Columbo's car. And they had two of those always parked in the lot, and I loved seeing those. I could see those from the window in my office and uh, I always loved looking at this thing. Look at that. Those are Peter Falk's cars from when he was Lieutenant Columbo. And all the clothes, they never throw anything out in the Edith Head building, one of the greatest designers in Hollywood history. And they, that building goes way down, well, into the earth. And uh, they bring up all sorts of clothes and plenty of mine in there too so you know what folks i love that you can still see perry mason and abbott and costello and chuck connors and dick van dyke and richard boone on me tv and they're not a sponsor i'm not just plugging them but go to me tv you'll know what i mean and you all know what i mean anyway because we know the same things we know that Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. Be well and watch Sven Gulli. We'll see you next time.